Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ritchie. And uh, you certainly set the stage and the platform and the question. No, no, that's fine. This is just for my reference. Certainly set the stage uh, for the debate. I'm not here to win the debate. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, as we make decisions for, for patients to go on to receive a transplant or not, it's an individual one at the end of the day. Yes, we want to improve the outcomes and, and the denominator effect to improve. Uh, but uh, as you can see, one of the biggest issues in transplantation, and that question everybody answered with high-risk uh, disease, 100%, but nobody saying you don't want to transplant. But that is not the reality. The reality is m m half of what you, you saw there up on the board. So my job today is to actually show that uh, it is possible to do so when there's no donor, uh, donor availability. So more from a Hamletian perspective, the question to ask is to do or not to do, that's the question. And in doing so, we'll discuss the subtype directed approaches for adult ALL, which we are more confident on a sure footing as, because we have uh, uh, very powerful agents and those new agents, how they can be incorporated in the present uh, therapy. So why a transplant? Obviously, the reason for a transplant in ALL, as it uh, holds good for many of the other hematological malignancies, uh, the most important reason is the immune effect from the most potent anti-leukemia treatment available. But then, to borrow a phrase uh, from Lorenzo Dew many years ago, damned if you do, damned if you don't. And that's where we stand with, because of transplant. You have GVHD, you have an infection conditioning, quality of life issues, long-term sequelae, not to mention the donor availability. So considering that, the issues to discuss uh, are possibly some of the uh, subtypes where we are making headways and progress, such as the Philadelphia positive ALL, and uh, perhaps targeting the immunophenotype, such as the CD20, the CD22, the CD19, and getting to MRD as just uh, Dr. Ritchie alluded to. I want a debate on the high-risk patients such as T411 or CR2 or isolated CNS relapse for now. And the reason we can, we can say that today is because ALL, is, as we understand, is a genomic disease. And our current approaches are much more sophisticated, as you will see. And we also understand that each patient's tumor is unique. And this is how it all started. And I won't spend much time except for the fact that this uh, set up a high standard, a high bar, if you will, in the adult uh, ALL uh, therapeutic um, uh, paradigm. And the reason we are not making progress is because of the cytogenetic abnormalities, as you will see here. And uh, it's driven by several proto-oncogenes. Identification of those proto-oncogenes is paramount. And identification of suitable targets that we can use in, in drug development is also important. And the children do better than adults because the favorable, the favorable uh, Chromosomal abnormalities are much more than the unfavorable ones in the adults. That being said, the prognosis as it stands can be divided in, cytogenetically into the three risk groups. And how do we improve this group, uh, the, the Philadelphia positive ALL, with tyrosine kinase inhibitor-based therapy? But you have to understand, before the advent of imatinib in CML, pH positive ALL was considered a very unfavorable prognosis. Typically, a CD10 positive B lineage, sometimes with co-expression of CD13 and 33 without myeloperoxidase and C-kit. And, and the other challenge was that increasing incidence with old age, more than 50% over the age of 50 years. And obviously, if you look at the overall treatment paradigm, pre imatinib era, the CRs were very high, but the disease-free survival was poor, 0 to 15%. And if you add on uh, allogeneic transplantation, no matter whether it's related or, uh, or unrelated, your five-year outcomes go up to 30%. So allo transplant was therefore considered the best chance for cure until, uh, and these are some of the data as you will see, the single digit numbers for chemotherapy alone and the transplant disease-free survival at uh, three years and five years. And the imatinib came and changed CML obviously, much slower to change the paradigm in ALL, only because the single agent therapies were not as successful as you saw in CML. There, was, there were responses seen, sustained response of about 30%, and you can see very little CRs, very little marrow CRs. However, when this is combined with chemotherapeutic regimens, and there are several regimens out there, so trying to incorporate into the stem of that therapy, whether it's induction and consolidation, as in hyper-CVAD, or the several other groups that looked at it, 
incorporating it. So we will talk about this and perhaps look at the snapshot of the data available so far. So I'll talk about the imatinib plus hyper CVAD, the most popular regimen in the United States. And it initially consisted of doing this in intensification and consolidation with hyper CVAD, the hyperfractionated cytoxin, vincristine, uh, adriamycin, and uh, decadron, along with high-dose methotrexate and high-dose cytarabine with the intermittent dosing of uh, imatinib initially, subsequently changed to continuous do dosing in the, in the consolidation phase. The maintenance phase also had the incorporation of imatinib along with the POMP regimen. And this is the data. As you can see, the CR rates, the survival curves, the, the hyper CVAT plus imatinib as compa compared to the historical controls in MD Anderson, there's a big difference in survival, about 70% to 80%. And more importantly, if you look at the survival, the survival was pretty impressive with the median survival more than about four years. And if you see if many of these patients could get to transplant or not, yes, and this is a small subset, and when the survival curves were teased out whether they got transplant or not, you can see that those patients who got hyper and imatinib and went on to receive a transplant obviously did the best. But those patients who could not get to a transplant either because of donor availability or various other issues, you can see they did much better than not getting imatinib. So there was definitely an advantage, but not as good as those patients who went on to receive a transplant. So you have to keep that in mind. And these are the several other regimens out there which show that the disease-free survival at four years vary from 50 to 65%, and the impressive overall survival that was seen in, in, with incorporation of imatinib. Now, that's the first generation imatinib. One of the issues with imatinib uh, is that it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. The second issue is that there's uh, several resistance mechanisms that can develop, particularly the, the BCR-able kinase domain mutation. So the second generation TKI, the first study that was done with, was with desatinib, and this particular paper is the first past report of the uh, ongoing study with hyper CVAD and desatinib in MD Anderson, you can see the response rates were very impressive, not only in terms of the CR, but also in at attaining this minimal residual disease. You can see the 61% of them were uh, MRD negative by flow cytometry or by uh, BCR able PCR. And we, uh, the, um, several of these patients uh, have not gone on to receive a transplant. There are other studies ongoing with hyper CVAD and, uh, and ponatinib currently in newly diagnosed uh, pH positive ALL. We also did a case series of patients with hyper CVAD and nilotinib and anecdotes that many of these patients who could not get to a donor are still surviving. In fact, I have a patient who is 40 years old, uh, couldn't get a, a donor in San Antonio, is still alive at four years and maintenance nilotinib. And as is a patient that I have currently who couldn't get a transplant, an Indian patient, um, and now is on ponatinib study and is on ponatinib maintenance. So, the enough confidence from these studies that if you don't have a donor available, and if you cannot get to a transplant, uh, obviously you can continue doing this as a maintenance. And until then, I think you have to think of trying to find the best possible way to get them to a transplant, and because they are very high risk uh, patients. It's possible, though, to think about it as a delay of transplant if they get to an MRD negativity, as was shown by Dr. Ritchie's um, um, slide on the recent MRD paper from blood. Nevertheless, the other ways of doing it is also by targeting the immunophenotype. Now, the B cells are rich with several immunophenotypes as can be identified as B cell markers. We'll talk about CD20, CD19, and CD22. And it is important to know the antigen expression of these during B cell development. 20 is later in development, 22 is a little earlier, and 19 is seen throughout the development of B cells. So keep that in mind. 19 is pan B in some ways. Uh, CD79 is perhaps the most important, and, and those antibodies are still in phase one development. But CD19, uh, uh, 22 a little later, and 20 the, the latest. So CD20 is a transmembrane protein. We all know about this in lymphoma. And how was this incorporated in Burkitt's type mature B cell leukemia lymphoma? Obviously, this is the starry sky picture of the Burkitt's type lymphoma, leukemia. The biology, as you all know, is driven by the CMIC in 8Q24 uh, loci. And they are mature B cells for the most part. And there's association with the EBV virus as a second hit that uh, allows this to progress very rapidly. And yes, it is an emergency. I recently saw a patient who was uh, 
um, uh, from Qatar with uh, Burkitt's lymphoma and the disease progressed very rapidly by the time she could uh, m m plan her trip from Qatar to Houston. And having said that, the way we have been able to treat these patients is with high intensity short course chemotherapy and also been uh, able, able to eliminate some of the CNS complications that are seen with this disease. And this is how the survival curves look like. This is uh, the overall survival looks this way. 50% uh, of them, 50 to 80% of them. But if you compare this to the cousin diseases, such as the diffuse large B cell lymphoma, it's still very poor. So how do we improve this in, uh, outcomes? And the way it's been done is by targeting the CD20. And as you can see, Debbie Thomas's work in 1999 and several others have shown that incorporating CD20 monoclonal antibodies uh, does make a difference. And the recent report shows a CR rate of about 86% and a three to five year disease-free survival of 80% with an overall survival of 80%. Obviously today, for Burkitt's leukemia, lymphoma, you always have to use rituxin with whatever chemotherapeutic regimen that you're using currently at your center. And so this is the uh, rituxin hyper data and the overall response rate as I showed you, the survival curve. This is the age characteristics and the survival. So if you compare the hyper rituxin uh, versus the hyper alone without the rituxin, there's a big difference in survival curve. For the first time, you start seeing flat lines parallel to the x-axis. And that is essentially amounts to a cure in this disease. And so similar data have been obtained from other centers. And this is the, GM, the, the GMALL group. And the overall survival, as you can see, is somewhat on the parallel slope, very similar to their data from a DLBCL. So it is impressive in Burkitt's leukemia and lymphoma. However, in the precursor B cell ALL, which also express CD20 to some extent, the data is a little different. First of all, I have to point out that the CD20 expression is not uniform in this precursor B cell or the pre-B cell. And the B cell development, you have the pro-B, the pre-pro-B, and the pre-B. So the pre-Bs don't normally express CD20. And at, at first, it was pointed out that CD20 may carry a negative prognostic uh, um, uh, entity. Uh, and that's how a rituxin was incorporated. And this is the summary of the data. So if you use rituxin in hyper containing regimens or any other treatment uh, therapeutic, chemotherapeutic option that you use for these patients, it does make a big difference for patients younger than 60 years. It is not clear for the older patients that incorporation of rituxin with chemotherapy has shown any survival advantage. Part of the reason could be the induction-related death with, by combining rituxin with the chemotherapy, and perhaps certain non-genotoxic treatments may be helpful in some of these older patients. How about the new monoclonal antibodies? Now, CD22 is um, another target, very earlier in expression, and enotuzumab is the prototype, which has not just the naked antibody, but has the payload device with chemotherapy. And this chemotherapy gets internalized after it gets, uh, uh, meets the target. And once it enters the cell, it, it is released and causes double-strand breaks in the DNA. So this is a very exciting antibody. And a study that was done in MD Anderson shows uh, this is the patient characteristics. Patients um, uh, uh, greater than uh, 60. It also included some pediatric patients. And many of these patients were, were, were relapsed, and some of them are refractory to treatment from first line, second line, and third line, including prior allo transplants, including a few pH positive disease patients. And as you can see, the expression of CD20 was pretty high, more than 90% in most of these patients. And this is the response. The overall response was about 57%. Very impressive in this uh, very early uh, data set. And this was actually published in Lancet Oncology recently with Dr. Kantarjian. And efficacy, you can see the overall efficacy when you compare the inotuzumab chemotherapy compared to any other agent that you might use in this particular setting, the response rate of 57 beats everything else. I have to say that the calichiamycin, the chemotherapy that's used in the payload device is very toxic. In fact, it comes from the clay in Texas, uh, in, the, uh, in, the in the mountains between Austin and San Antonio. And if used by, by itself, can cause a lot of toxicity. But by using this, the, the, the uh, antibody actually homes in on the cancer cell and destroys them. So the further challenges are to try to incorporate this in the chemotherapeutic armamentarium. That brings us to the minimal residual uh, status in ALL, which I think is a very important goal, and it has been incorporated in, in the assessment. 
and, and Dr. Ritchie did talk about it. And if you look at it from a con conceptual perspective, when you say somebody's in a CR, you still have a lot of cells. So it's a numbers game. The NCI CR is one followed by these many zeros. And if you want to get to the point where you start seeing cure, you have to go at least a few log reductions in the zeros so that you can achieve the MRD negativity. And achieving this is the goal, and this is what an uh, uh, allo transplant does in addition to its immune effects. So this is where the role of CD19 monoclonal antibody comes along. Blinatumumab is a CD19 monoclonal antibody. It's not just an antibody, but it is a bispecific T-cell engager, which means it not only targets CD19, the tumor cell, but also summons the T-cell by attracting it through the CD3. So it's, it's called a bite, bispecific T-cell engager. And a single agent study was done in the setting of patients who had achieved a response, 21 patients, 20 available for response, and CR after first cycle, you can see, was very high with a three-year uh, relapse-free survival of close to 80%. And you can see the complete molecular response was 80%. Very impressive uh, with this uh, bite technology. And you can start seeing curves which are parallel to the x-axis, all patients. And some of these patients without uh, a transplant were much higher than what you saw in the previous survival curves. So blinatumumab studies are ongoing. This is one such study. It's an international study of three cohorts. And over, uh, right now, this is very early data. This is the overall survival of the different cohorts of patients. And you can see that this could be something that can be incorporated, particularly in patients who don't have a donor available. Finally, I want to stop with this BCR signal transduction. The excitement with new agents continues. Now you have the pan B cell receptor triggering pathways, as we know, through the LIN, BTK, and also the PI3 kinase. The signal initiation, the signal propagation, and the signal integration happens through some of these pathways. And, when, and there, are there are small molecules, if you will, that can target the LIN, the BTK, the SIC, and the PI3 kinase. So trying to add this with the, some of the monoclonal antibody strategies might actually be very beneficial for some of these patients, not only in the minimal residual disease setting, but also for elderly uh, ALL patients. So in summary, risk-adapted strategies have changed the outcomes. So significant progress in targeting uh, the tyrosine kinase and immunophenotype have improved the survival. So for no donors and, uh, and the ability to obtain MRD can, you know, can postpone, if you can, uh, can postpone or obviate the need for a transplantation. So in Hamlet's words, if you are a transplanter, apologies to the bard. To do or not to do, that's the question, whether it's nobler in mind to offer the slings and shots of outrageous chemotherapy or to take arms against a sea of trouble to transplant. So the answer, never the marrow when you have the targeted arrow that can reduce it to minimal sorrow. Thank you. <laughs>